and welcome to Orchard Hill. My name is Sam Norris and I'm on staff here with Student Ministry. If this is your first time, we are so glad that you've chose to be here. There's a lot happening on the Hill and I'd like to tell you about a few things. You asked for it and we answered. Next weekend, our senior pastor, Dr. Kurt Bjorklund, continues the series, You Asked For It, with a message entitled, Why Is the Christian Life So Hard? This will be a great message and has been an incredible series, and we really encourage you to come check it out. The word Elias is a Greek word that means mercy, or specifically a gift of mercy. The Elias ministry of Orchard Hill Church reaches beyond its own walls to serve those in need in the North Hills, Pittsburgh, and in Haiti. In addition to Kids Fest Haiti, Orchard Hill sponsors periodic short-term mission trips to Haiti. You can make a difference by partnering with others at Orchard Hill on a trip this fall. The team will be traveling to Cap Haitian Haiti on October 11th through the 19th. The team will be filled on a first come, first serve basis. So if you're interested in participating, make sure to stop by the Welcome Center to get more information. There's even more happening here on the Hill, so be sure to check out the top five in your update. Stop by the Welcome Center and pick up the newly redesigned On the Hill card. Just look inside and you'll find all the upcoming events this summer and fall for adults, students, and kids, including Orchard Hill Sports and Rec. Visit us online at orchardhillchurch.com or stop by the Welcome Center to register today. Be sure to fill out an In the Loop card if you're new and want more information about Orchard Hill Church. This past week, we had over 480 kids here for Kids Fest. Here's a video for you to see all of the awesome things that God did this past week. Take a look.
when God looked at our world and he saw this sin problem in every single person, he said, I want to save these people. I want to rescue them because I love them. What we want you guys to learn this week is that God loves you so much that he gave his only son so that you can go to heaven with him. Welcome to Orchard Hill Church. We're so glad that each of you are here. Would you please stand with us as we worship God? He is in this place.
this time, the ushers are going to come forward and receive the offering. If you're new or if you're visiting with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. And please don't feel any obligation to give.
strong in the Savior's love. What a great line. We are all able to love because he first loved us. And sometimes in love, we need to set up healthy boundaries in our relationships. On the other hand, sometimes in love, we need to forgive those who have hurt us deeply. Either way, love is not always easy, but it is definitely worth it.
How do I know that the Bible is the real word of God? What does the Bible say about the earth being old or new? You know, I always wondered about that. I read that people can be healed. Is that possible? How can all the Old Testament people be hundreds of years old? How can that actually be true? I really never thought about it that way. Who decided what books made the Bible and which books were cut out? Why do bad things happen to the good people I know? What does it mean when God says he's everywhere and knows everything? Does it really mean that? How do I know if what I'm reading in the Bible actually happened or if they're just stories? I don't think the word Trinity is in the Bible. Is that a real thing? Am I even reading this right? Why does science contradict the Bible? How can a book with so many different authors be one piece of work. I would love for this to be true. Is it really true? Well, we are down to the last two weeks of You Asked For It, and there were several questions asked around the idea of forgiving people who've wronged you. Some of the questions were around the idea of how can I forgive somebody? I know I should. How can I? Some were around the idea of saying it's really hard. I'm not sure I want to. And then there were some questions around the idea of when does forgiveness become enablement? When am I enabling somebody's poor behavior by continuing to forgive? There are no doubt, uh, there's no doubt about the fact that all of us in this room at some time or another have been wronged and have felt the need to deal with this issue. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says that the idea of forgiveness in our Western monotheistic culture, that's how they phrased it, has long been seen as a virtue and a failure to forgive is a vice. The Mayo Clinic on their website talking about forgiveness cites these positive benefits of forgiving. It says, when you forgive, you'll have healthier relationships, you'll have greater spiritual and psychological well-being, you'll have less anxiety, stress, and hostility, and you'll have lower blood pressure. And then a few years ago, there was a song, a country song, by Tim McGraw that talked about what he would do if he found out that he was dying. It was called Live Like You're Dying, and the chorus went like this. I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Blue Manchu. I loved deeper, I spoke sweeter, and then the last line before it went into the kind of this is what I'd do, said, and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. And the idea in the song, and I think one of the things besides the idea of I did all these things, is people said when relationships are set right, then I know I'm ready to die. Undoubtedly, you've seen some people in your life whose bitterness has destroyed not just the relationship that originally was the hurt, but have caused them to become bitter and struggle in other relationships. And yet it's really hard to forgive. It's really hard to get in a, pl- in a place where we can say, I will let go of the way you've offended me. In fact, if you ever find yourself watching a TV show or a movie and you get into the revenge theme, do you know what I'm talking about when I say the revenge theme? There's this funny moment that happens where somebody's about to blow somebody's head off in revenge, and at least for me, it's kind of funny because I'm like, yeah, yeah, and then I think, I'm not sure that's what Jesus would do. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, and and although most of us here probably would say, I'll never seek revenge with a gun, but we know what it is to say, but I still want that person to pay in some way. And usually what that means isn't I'll even take active vengeance, but it means I'm going to limit forgiveness and I will withhold forgiveness. And so our form of vengeance tends to be one in which we basically say, I'm going to be cold, I'm going to make sure other people know what you did. I'll limit it, and I will withhold forgiveness. Well, in this parable that I want to look at today, we see something that Jesus does. It's in response to a question, and this is found in Matthew 18, verses 21 and following. It says, And Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then he says, Up to seven times? Now, likely, Peter, in saying up to seven times, 
thought of himself as being very generous because seven was the number of completion. And so probably what he was doing was he was saying, how many times do I have to forgive somebody who's been a jerk? Seven times? That's complete, right? And then Jesus gives his response. He says, no, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And most people who study the Bible commentators say that the 77 doesn't mean you count to 77 and on the 78th time or the 491st time if you take it as 77, 70 times 7. What most think it means is that you at some point say, I'll just keep forgiving. Now to make his point, Jesus tells the story, this parable. Here's how it reads. And these characters represent how we often interact. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, 10,000 bags of gold may not be easy for us to get our hands around. Some translations say 10,000 talents. In fact, and this is the NIV. If you look in the footnotes, it says 10,000 talents. And then it says a talent was the equivalent of an average worker's wage for 20 years. Now, just let me try to put this in perspective. If the average income, or just for round numbers, let's say that the average income was $50,000. If somebody earned $50,000 in a year, what would happen is they would then say it takes 20 years to get that kind of one talent. So that means that the debt is 10,000 times that. In dollars, that would be about $10 billion, just to put this in perspective. Then it says this, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So now he's facing slavery for himself and for his family. Because he's got incurred this debt. By the way, you don't incur a $10 billion debt in like a casual manner. In all likelihood, this debt was either incredible gross negligence or more likely fraud. Where the man had literally stolen from the king. The king finds it or this master finds it. And he says, I want these people sold says this, verse 26, at this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will repay everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Again, the footnote says a denarii which was one day's wage. Again, back to the analogy, just so the math works, of $50,000 a year, 50 weeks, five days a week, $200 a day. So this man owed him $200. He's just been forgiven $10 billion in debt, and now he's trying to find somebody who owes him $200. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. He demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And it says this, verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Now, I don't know how that strikes you. But this parable is troubling to me. And it's troubling to me because Jesus doesn't mince words. He, in essence, says if you don't forgive somebody who's wronged you, that you are, what's his word? Not my word, what's his word? Wicked. 
Now, he doesn't simply say, you're unspiritual, you're not refined, you're not as far along as you should be. He says, you're wicked. That's a strong word from Jesus. And I would like to, just for a few moments, talk about why he uses this word wicked. Then I'd like to talk about what forgiveness is and what enablement is, and then where can we get the power to forgive if we find it hard. So first, why does Jesus use this word wicked? Well, there's at least three reasons that we can see in this text. The first is that there is something in the eternal nature of forgiveness that calls for us to forgive other people. In fact, Jesus goes so far in verse 35 as to say, this is how my heavenly Father will treat you. And he, in essence, calls into question a person's eternal standing with God by their lack of willingness to forgive. Now, if you're a person who's studied the Bible over time, that should send off a warning sign to you, what I just said. You should say, wait a second, wait a second. Our only way of being right with God is the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus dying and me acknowledging that. Otherwise, it's a works righteousness if it's about me forgiving somebody else. I agree. But don't move there too quickly until you let the force of Jesus' words sink in. Part of the reason that he says you're wicked is because what is possible is that if you say over time, I will not, I cannot forgive somebody who's wronged me, that you don't actually have the love of Jesus in you because you haven't experienced forgiveness. Now, it's right to say that only the cross, only Jesus can forgive our sins, not us forgiving others, But part of why I think Jesus uses this word wicked is he's saying it's possible that what you're doing when you fail to forgive is you're revealing that your own heart has never been regenerated. But not only that, there's a second thing that we see here, and I'm just simply going to say that this is self-righteousness. Now again, take this parable that Jesus tells, this story. Here's a person who's been forgiven 10,000 talents, $10 billion dollars. And then he goes out and gets all worked up over somebody who owes him a denarii or $200, roughly speaking. To get there, part of what has to happen is you have to look at yourself and be able to say, I'm pretty good. I haven't been forgiven much. And what happens when we don't forgive people, and I think, again, part of why Jesus calls this person wicked is because we fail to see our own sinfulness before God. In fact, some of you are here right now, and you're saying, you know, I'm not sure I even believe in God or Jesus, the cross, forgiveness, but I sure have somebody who's hurt me, and I sure have a hard time forgiving. And what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, It takes somebody who is so blinded to their own debt to insist on somebody else's debt. And again, the the analogy here is ultimately that God is the king and that we're the debtor who is forgiven this incredible debt by what Jesus does on the cross. And then when we hold something against somebody else, what we're doing is we're forgetting our debt and saying, you pay me back those $200 right now. And what we're doing in many ways is we're being blind to our own sinfulness. Sometimes people think that talking about sin is not positive because they think, well, you know, sin is this uh, this negative concept. But what recognizing our sin does is it allows us to say in essence I no longer have to try to make myself feel better about myself around other people instead I can can release it because I can say I've been forgiven so I can be free to forgive instead of having to say I'm better than and what happens when we hold on to something is there's a little piece of us that likes the feeling of superiority I would never do what they did I would never stoop to the level that he stooped to. I'd never do the things she did. And part of what, what's happening is, is we're not acknowledging our own potential to do things that are worse 
or our own reality of having done things that are worse. We're blinded in that moment. In fact, in that little phrase, and I think it's verse 25, 26, where he says he took pity on him. The word pity in the original language means to have compassion. And what, what's happening when, when he says that the king had pity is when the man went out then to demand money from this other man, he had no pity. He had no compassion. He couldn't see anything except himself. And in a way, that's the third kind of reason I think he calls this wicked, is we only see the worst in others when we fail to forgive. You know, if I or you are dishonest about something, what we typically do is we'd say, well, it was complicated, there were a lot of factors, you know, I may have bent the truth a little bit. Somebody else is dishonest around us, what do we do? They're a liar. Liar, liar, liar. Because there's a little piece of us that says, they told a lie, they're just a liar if we're insensitive about something. Well, the other people are just getting too worked up. Or if we walk past a need somewhere, we just say, well, I'm being responsible with my own stuff. Other people are selfish. And that's part of why I think Jesus goes all the way here and he says this is wicked when it's true of us. Miroslav Volf, who has written broadly, put it this way. He said, forgiveness flounders because I exclude my enemy from the community of humans. In other words, I don't take pity on them. I don't see it from their point of view. And I exclude myself from the community of sinners. In other words, the reason that I can't forgive sometimes is that I look at somebody else and I say, they're not even like human in what they did. And then we exclude ourselves from ever having a debt from ever being in a place of needing to be forgiven. Now, Jesus uses that word wicked, so what does it mean then for us to forgive? What is forgiveness and what is enabling? Verse 26, here we see the example of what it is. And uh, 27, it says, At this the servant fell on his knees before him and said, Be patient with me. And he begged and said, I'll repay everything. And then the master did this. It says he took pity on him. He saw things from him. He identified with him. He had compassion. And then it says that he what? That he canceled the debt. Now to have pity on somebody means that rather than saying, I just see myself as being above the community of sinners and everything else, but I see the person and their pain in whatever it is that they did, and I enter into it. I heard the story years ago about a man who got on an airplane with his children and his children were uh, not behaving very well and some of the other passengers were annoyed. And finally, one of the other passengers nudged him and said, do you think you could get control of your kids? They're making a ruckus and making it hard for everyone else to have a good flight. And the man said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I guess they are a little out of control. And as they talked for just a moment, they other passenger realized that this man's wife had just died and the kids and family were returning from a funeral. And so here they were being annoyed. Well, all the time, if he could have seen into this person's perspective, he could have seen it differently. So the first part of, uh, of forgiving is to say, I'll see it here. But then we use, he uses this phrase, canceled the debt. And this is very instructive and it fits with the rest of what scripture teaches about this idea because to forgive is ultimately to say, I will pay for what you've done to me. Now hear this for a few moments. When something happens where we feel done wrong, somebody has to pay. Usually, if something's small, what happens is we go, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. For example, if after the service tonight, somebody came up to me and had a pen and they were playing with it and they broke it and the ink spilled all over my shirt, I wouldn't be happy, but most likely what I'd say is, don't worry about it, I'll buy a new shirt. But I lost the use of the shirt. Now, the other option would be to say, no, I want the money for the shirt. Please, you know, pay me now kind of a thing. 
Somebody has to pay, though, or I lose use of the shirt. What happens when we forgive somebody is we say, I will pay the debt. I'll cancel the debt. I won't demand payment from you anymore. I'll let you go. Now, a lot of times, our payment, or what it is we demand, is not monetary repayment. It's that somebody pays a debt in terms of hurt and pain and time and coldness and aloofness from us. And what we'll want is we'll want them to somehow pay. But what forgiveness is, is saying, I'm not requiring that you pay anymore. Now, Peter's question at the beginning of this, how many times do I have to forgive, in a way was the question of enablement. He's saying, how many times do do I have to forgive? Jesus says, you have to keep on forgiving. So how do we understand this idea of when we're enabling somebody who behaves poorly toward us? Now, there's a couple of clues in this passage because the man who took advantage of the forgiveness was called on it by the king. You have to be a little careful making that analogy because the point of this overall parable is that the king is like God and we're like the debtor. And so to put ourselves in the place of God here and say this is what we should do is a little dangerous. But I think it's fair to say that that this man was called on his poor behavior. And there are two things that seem to be evident of when somebody is being forgiven and using it as a way of enablement. The first is when somebody's behavior is dangerous or unsafe to others. To simply say, I forgive and it's all good and not deal with the danger side of a person's behavior may be an enabling characteristic. For example, if you let somebody drive your car and they're reckless with it and they wreck it, you don't have to say to them, you know what, here's my keys, go again. What you can do instead is say, I forgive you. In that case, you may even ask for restitution if you don't have insurance that covers it all. But at the end of the day, you can say, I'm not going to let you drive my car again because you were reckless until you earn trust again. But here's where forgiveness is thwarted sometimes in the idea of saying, I won't enable somebody, and that is we don't give somebody a chance to ever earn trust again. When we start to say, you've blown it in such a way that I'll never give you the keys to my car ever, ever, ever again. Now, it may be decades, but forgiveness means, at least in part, that I'm giving you an opportunity to earn trust. It doesn't mean I give you trust today, because that can be a violation of enablement if the person's unsafe or dangerous. The second thing that that we see here is that if the person fails to take responsibility, it could be enablement. And we see this because the the servant basically doesn't take responsibility for his debt and he's unsafe to the other person and he doesn't even fully appreciate what he's had. And the reason I say this is sometimes we enable when we're too quick to forgive and don't expect a person to take responsibility. But once a person takes responsibility and agrees to work toward safe structure, then we have passed that bar of saying, now I need to forgive. And the issue here is we ultimately still need to forgive. I heard Tim Keller talk on this some time ago. And Tim Keller put it this way. He says, you say you're a Christian, but you are denying the very gospel you profess. And what he was doing was he was saying, those of you who say, I'll forgive when it feels good, you're denying how much you've been forgiven. And then a little later, after talking about just some other issues, he said this, He said to a person who says, I won't forgive, he says, you don't have the right to the name Christian until you forgive. I heard those statements. I thought, those are radically hard statements. Now, I would guess that some of you are sitting here right now and you're arguing with this. 
and you're saying, all right, I, I kind of get it, I understand it conceptually, but you don't know how somebody's hurt me. You don't know the pain I'm carrying from this person in my life. And you're right, I don't. Some of you have been hurt. And your stories, if you told them tonight to everyone who was here, would move us to tears. So where do you get the power to forgive like this? Where do I get the power to forgive like this? Well, in this text, there's at least two things that we can see. And by the way, the Mayo Clinic and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, their way to get there is to simply say, look at the benefits of being a forgiving person and that the consequences and negative effects in your own life of not being it, weigh them until you get to a point of forgiving. I think they miss something. And what they miss is what Jesus talks about here, and that is the focus on how much we've been forgiven. Until we come to grips with our own sinfulness and our own debt and how much God has forgiven us, we will be inclined toward self-righteousness. The only way that, that, that I can begin to say I can forgive somebody who's wronged me is when I say I've been forgiven $10 billion and they owe me 200 And the only way I'll ever get there, the only way you'll ever get there is by coming to grips with my sin and how much Jesus has forgiven me, what I owe him, his holiness, and how consistently and routinely I violate God's standard for my life. If I don't get that, if I don't live there, I'll lean toward self-righteousness. And sometimes, even understanding that, we can forget how much we've been forgiven. And as a result, we start to feel superior again and start to feel like we can demand somebody else pay. Instead of saying, I'll absorb that cost, I'll pay. But there's a second resource that's here, and it's actually before this passage starts, and Usually when we take a story from the New Testament, we'll look at that story, but the context is always important too. And in verses 15 through 20 of Matthew 18, there's this issue of church discipline. Now, this is interesting in its placement. Because right before this great story about forgiving and everything else, there's this this issue of what a church should do. Verse 15 and following, it says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take two or three others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Jesus, by the way, hung out with pagans and tax collectors when he says this. He's not saying, in essence, treat them like like they're some bad people. He's saying, call one another to account when relationships are broken and when there's sin. One of the challenges in the modern church is that people treat church like consumers. And what I mean by that is what they do is they come to a church for a little while, and as long as the teaching's good and the music's good and the kids' programs are good and there's good things, they hang around. But as soon as somebody gets kind of a little out of their, 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 their place in their mind, they say, well, I'll just do a different church somewhere else. But the ideal in the New Testament was that people lived in such rich and consistent community that when they got crosswise with somebody, when somebody got off on their kind of life and their deal, and people were like, I don't want to deal with that, that the church would help them come back together. Now, what's humbling about this, and part of why we like to live as consumers, is it's a lot easier to say, I'll deal with that myself. I don't need anybody else telling me how this will go. But the picture here is to say, focus on how much you've been forgiven and then let the people around you help you see where maybe you're holding on to bitterness too long. I'll never forget years ago when I was pastoring in another town. 
I was at this church, and there's this one lady who started having relational fractures with everybody in her life, first with her mom, who did not attend the church, then with her daughter, her grown daughter. So she was out of relationship with her mom, out of relationship with her daughter, wouldn't talk to her daughter. And then it started to happen with her friends, one after another. And I remember talking with her one day and and trying to challenge her and say, your relationships are following a pattern. Do you think maybe there's like a common denominator here? I was more gentle than that, but and she got mad at me. How dare you? You don't know what they did. You don't know that. Because what she was doing in that moment was justifying herself and saying, I don't want anybody to call me to account. Sometimes, We need some people around us to say, maybe you need to let that go. Maybe you need to forgive. And that only happens when we plant ourselves in community and we remember how much we've been forgiven. I heard a story years ago about a father and son who had had a ruptured relationship. And the father, he lived in Mexico City. The father and the son had lost all connection. They didn't even know where his son lived. Hadn't talked in 15 years. And the father didn't know how to repair the relationship. He thought he was coming to the end of his life. So he took out an ad in the newspaper that simply said, Pablo, all is forgiven. Meet me tomorrow at noon. And he specified a place. When he showed up the next day, there were hundreds of Pablos (laughs) looking for their dad to repair the relationship. we live like we're dying maybe we'd speak sweeter maybe we would ride a bull but one of the things that would matter is saying I want to set things right and it's one of the sweetest things that you can do and it's one of the best ways to reflect who Christ is and you can do it without enabling somebody's behavior by simply saying I forgive but you need to earn back trust And you need to take responsibility on some level for what's happened. And just remember what Jesus does here. He says, if you don't, he says, you're the wicked one. And now what you've done is you've turned somebody else's wrong and you've become the one who's in the wrong. So how do we forgive? compassion and cancel the debt? Where do we get the power looking at what Jesus has done and allowing people to speak into our lives? And when we do, we can be people of grace, people of kindness who can say all is forgiven. Let's make this relationship right. Father, I ask tonight that for those of us who've been hurt deeply, those of us with unresolved relational muck right now, that you would not let us simply walk out and go about our night, but that you would help us to do business with the story that you told and the truths that it represents. God, for some of us here, that may mean making a phone call. It may mean beginning a dialogue. It may mean drawing a boundary that we haven't drawn or we've just been enabling. God, whatever it means, I pray that we would run to your forgiveness and allow it to drive us to be people of grace and people who give grace. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.